So when it comes to chapter one, guys, now this is one of the easiest chapter for the exam. It's the best one. But think of this chapter as a foundational chapter. Again, when I say foundational, that means all of the terms that you're going to hear from chapter one, you'll hear them all the way for the next 26 chapters. So again, this is your foundation. Okay. Now on the exam, this is not a big chapter. They usually give you two to three questions. Kind of, that's kind of an average marks. Um, but again, I'll show you all of them. You'll understand it well, but just again, treat it as a foundation for everything else. Okay. So on all of the exams, it doesn't matter which one you're planning to do. They're always going to question you on this slide by itself. So all of you guys will have at least one to two questions right here by itself, because they want to make sure that you have a really clear picture between different type of sources of the laws, which one is the common law, which one is the equitable law? What's the main differences? Okay. So every time when you hear a saying common law, we're referring to the oldest law. Now, if somebody says common law, think of it this way. It's the oldest, it's the rigid law. It's something that is not uh, commonly used anymore because it's so old, but it came all the way from England. So every time you see it comes from England, think of it as, okay, that's the common law. So English settlers, when they came to Canada, they say, come on people, you don't have enough law, so use what we brought for you. <laughs> so they brought us common law, okay? So now this step of law, it's, based on the doctrine of stare decisis. Now that is a Latin word, maybe I don't say it properly, but that's how I say it. The doctrine of stare decisis is a Latin word stands for let the former decision stand. So what they're trying to tell you is this. Okay, let's pretend I'm the judge. You come in front of me and says, look, Anna, I wanna sue somebody. And I'm like, yeah, go ahead, sue them. Okay, but as a judge, I'm telling you straight up, we only have to come a lot this time and I cannot make my own decisions. So what it means, it's like I have handcuffs on my hands and I say, you know what, my hands are tied, there's nothing I can do. So you tell me your case and what I will do, I'll look at the previous higher court decisions. So whatever came up from the higher courts, we call them precedents. So I'm telling you, I'm going to look at the higher precedents from the other court systems and I'll see what they came up with and I'll take their decision and I will apply it in your case. You see how it works? So again, as a judge, can I make my own decisions based on the common law? Yes or no? No, I cannot. So what do I do? I'll look at the higher precedents. If they already had a case just like yours, what do I do? I take their decision and apply it to you and I say, okay, this is what's going to happen to you now. Okay. Do you see how the common law is based? So on the exam, they'll ask you this and they're very specific, especially this year, they're going to ask you, what is this law is about? It's a judge made law. So again, judge doesn't make his own decision. He makes a, the other judge from the higher courts and whatever they come up with those decisions, they'll apply it to this specific case. You see how it works? So it's a judge made law typically recorded in a written decisions. So again, it is a written decision. It's not a verbal decisions. It's something that I can find already done, already written down. I'll take it and I'll apply it to you. Now tell me, is that fair enough? <laughs> So again, not the most flexible law. It's probably the least flexible out of all of them. But again, right now you have to understand. So every time we teach you something, we teach you how to read the keywords. So again, if you see it says comes from England, okay, common law. If I say it's a judge made law, now that comes from, so again, that's a common law. If I say that doctrine of stare decisis, so if I say those keywords, then you think of it as a common law, okay? Next one, because of all this, um, not flexibility, it kind of created a uniformity. So on the exam, you'll say it's a uniform law. So what does that mean? So it means if you come to me, let's say somebody stole your car. Okay. And what do I do? I look at the higher precedence. I find a case just like yours, and then I will apply it to you. So as a judge, would I know what will happen to you in some way? Would I have an idea what will happen to your case? Yes, I would. Why? Because I already have something to refer to. I already know what they came up with. I already know what decision they want to apply in my case. So it kind of created a uniformity. So that means all of the, so there was not much flexibility. Basically, everybody kind of knew what's going to happen at some point. But what if I say this to you? And again, an exam is, it's how they say things. You have to recognize if it's true or false statements. So if I say to you, I say this, all of the cases will be predictable with absolute certainty. Now, would that be true now? Okay. It is uniform, but with all of the cases will be predictable with absolute certainty. Do you see how that word absolute made things too strong? And I call those ones are the keywords. So those ones are too strong words. So if I say must be, not all must, but a lot of must will be false. Always, regardless, if I say absolute, that becomes a false statement. So in this case, it's uniform, but not 
with some certainty, not absolute certainty. Okay? So precedence is just the early decisions that we come up with. So I have another question for you. What if I'm the judge? <laughs> and they came to look at somebody stole my car. So they, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Let me look at the higher precedence. And then I look at the other decisions and there's nobody ever stole a car in British Columbia. <laughs> you know, we're the best profits ever. So what do I, can I come up with my own decision now? And this is what they will ask you. Can the judge still come up with his own decision then? And the answer is always the same. Mm -mm. Cannot make it. So what happens now? So my question is, can I go to different provinces to look for the cases just like yours? Yes, I can. As long as they adopted the common law, as long as they have that law, then I can go back and reference. Now, what if, what if I look through the whole Canada and there's not even one case just like this one? What do I do? <laughs> can I make my own decision now? And again, the answer is always going to be the same. No, I cannot. So what do I do? Can I go to different countries now? Yes, I can. So I can go to anywhere that they adopted the common law, to England, Australia, whoever has it. Do you see what happens? Okay. So the other things you have to understand is the, what's the remedies that comes with common law. So let's say you love your car and somebody stole your car and you pimped it out and you put these nice wheels on it and you know, there are a lot of things in there and you come and you says, look, Anna, they stole it. I really want it back. And I said, based on the common law, the only thing you can ask for, well, the only thing I can do for you, I can sue that person for damages. So that means if we find him, we're going to sue him for money. So damages for the exam is money. Do you see how it works? So again, for the exam, if they ask you, again, can I ask for that car back based on the common law? I have no rights because the only thing I can go after or you can go after that person is to sue them for damages. So in exam, that's what they will question you for. They will ask you which remedy comes with which law. So again, if I refer to the common law, okay, damages comes with that. Okay, so that makes sense. Then we have the equitable law. So again, at that time, there was a king who came up with this and he says, okay, everybody complains about the common law because it is too strict, it's too rigid. So he came up with another law, it's called the equitable law. And it's the law of fairness, and that's all you have to know. So that means now the judge has options, so he can exercise both laws. Now, for the example, they'll use the word they exercise both laws. And I know you might think of exercise like using it, but on exam, it's looking at two different laws. So again, you come to me and say, somebody sold a car, so what do I do? Pull up the common law. So it's based on common law, you can sue them for damages. But if you want your car back, then I'll go towards the equitable law. So What's equitable is the law of fairness. Can I ask for the car back in this case? So look at the remedies, what I can do based on the equitable law. So one of the remedies is called a specific performance. So that means I can specifically tell somebody to do something against their own will. So if somebody stole your car and they really love your car because you pimped it out, <laughs> I say, you know what, you have to bring it back. You have to return it back. So I can specifically tell them what to do as a judge. Okay? An injunction will be opposite from specific, where the judge tells you something not to do. So again, if somebody crosswalks on your trespass on your property all the time, and you call the police and says, can you put an injunction on that person? Can you stop, stop, stop him from coming close to my property? Okay, so that's called the injunction. So again, when it comes to equitable law, this is the law where you can ask for things to make or stop somebody to do something, okay? So, for the exam, they like specific, and we're going to get more into that when it comes to higher chapters, when we're going to start talking about the contracts. But let's say if somebody really, 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 really likes the house, they've been looking for a specific house for such a long time, and there's nothing suitable in the market other than this specific property. You put an offer, the offer gets accepted by the seller, and now suddenly the seller got a backup offer, and he wants to cancel on you, and he basically breaches the contract. Usually when people breach the contract, you sue them for what? You sue them for money. So if I was the judge and you come to me and say like, Yana, I really want a house. And I say, based on common law, if somebody breaches the contract, we'll sue them for money. Okay. They'll pay you something back. But he says, no, 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 no. I don't want money. I want that house. Do you see? So now the judge will say, okay, I can specifically tell the seller to continue the contract with you. So again, we'll teach you all, to all that stuff later, but just know what specific is. Not looking for money, looking for something that they really want, okay? Or that car or whatever the house is. Injunction, stopping them. And then we have the quantum merit. Right now on the exam, they start to expand you on the quantum merit. Quantum merit is another Latin word. I wish I could teach you some Russian stuff in here, <laughs> maybe next time. But the quantum merit is another keyword that you have to know. It stands for as much as you deserve. I'm just gonna show you a long slide 
oh, it's actually not here. Okay, that's fine. So there's a quantum area. So when somebody says a quantum area, as much as you deserve. So what does that mean? It means if, let's say you got into the contract and they breached it, they haven't paid you, okay? And it doesn't specify in the contract how much they have to pay you. Under the quantum merit rule, the law will apply a promise to pay. So in the exam, they talk about the quantum merit is basically the court comes up with his own decision. So again, people always get confused between damages and quantum. Damages is when definitely the courts will come and sue you for the money. In this case, quantum merit, sometimes they will choose something or they can specifically push somebody to do something or they will apply or the court will decide will be the best um, best uh, way to compensate somebody. So on the exam, if they ask you quantum merit, think of it as the law will apply a promise to pay the reasonable amount. And that's the keyword that they're looking for. It's a promise, right? Reasonable, okay? Who knows how much you're gonna get? Reasonable, okay? So again, for the exams, watch for this. If they're gonna say this, out of the two laws, which one will prevail, which one will win, which one will be the stronger one in the court system? between common and equitable. What do you think? Okay. Equitable is stronger. So again, if I was the judge and you come in front of me, somebody stole your car, then guess what? I said, based on this, we can sue them for money, but I know you really, really want the car. So I'll go towards equitable law. So equitable always prevails. It's stronger than the, than the common law. You see how it works? Now, next one. On the exam, they're always going to try to trick you. And what they would try to do, they're going to try to mix and match the remedies. So they'll say the judge will sue somebody for damages, but also for the specific performance. And they will ask you, is that a true false statement? What do you think? Can they mix and match the remedies? So if I can exercise both laws, so what does that mean exercise? It means I can look at all of them. I can look at the common, I can look at the equitable, and then what do I do? Then I pick one. So again, on the exam, if they try to mix and match for you the remedies, it's not possible. Why? Because I have to pick one remedy, one law or the other law. I will look at both of them. I will exercise both of the laws, common and the equitable, but then I would choose one. So if I see damages and specific, that becomes a false statement because they are not mixed and matchable. Okay. Then we have the statute law. So again, when somebody says a statute law, think of it as a legislation. It comes through the governments because the government created the statute law. What's the reason for to change this? Why? Because the common law is so old. <laughs> we still have a law that says that you can, have a, you can park a horse in front of the bar. It's actually a real law right now in our statements. So again, how often do we use that? How many of you guys are gonna get drunk tomorrow and get a, get a horse? So <laughs> do you see what I mean? Some of them needs to be changed. So statute law was created through the legislation. So on the exam, if they talk about legislation, think of it as a government. And the other easy question will come up on the exam if they ask you, what is a legislation? The answer is land title act. So on the exam, if they ask you, what is a legislation? Think of it as a land title act. Okay. That's what they refer to. And if they ask you, what's the point of the statute law? What's the whole main purpose of this is to change or alter the common law. So again, the statute law, is going to be, is the only one, the government is the only body basically who can actually change or do alteration to the actual common law. Nobody else can do this. Okay. We have three types of government. I'm going to skip this part because it's not what they're looking for, but we do have provincial, uh, we have <clears throat> municipal governments, right? And we have federal governments for the exam. Just, just know federal is the one that deals with a lot of different matters, but there's one thing that he doesn't deal is the educational stuff. And that's why in every single province, if, if you're going to get licensed in British Columbia, it's going to be totally different ways of uh, getting licensed at different provinces, right? So it's because it's a provincial government who is responsible for education, not the actual federal one. Okay. So can you highlight this for the exams, please? The last part of it. So for the exam, let me ask you this. This will look, if I was the judge again, and you come in front of me, which law would I look at first? Okay. So again, if I had to look at the common law, equitable in the statute, which one would I look, which one is the strongest one? Because as a judge, why would I waste my time in something that is weakest one? Okay. For the example, if I say, what would I look for? First, I look at the statute law and then I'll look at everything else. Okay. So statute law is what the most important one. So if I ask you out of the three laws, which one is the strongest out of all of them? The statute. Okay. Then the next one, is the equitable and the shortest one, sorry, not the shortest one, but the weakest one, it will be the common law. Okay. So if I ask you which one will prevail, which one will, 
So statue is stronger than equitable, equitable stronger than the common law. Okay, fun stuff, I'm telling you. So all of you guys will have at least one to two questions right here. I think it's pretty simple. Okay, so let's do some question. Question one on page four out of your notes that you have. So quantum merit. Now for people who's doing course online, make sure you print them out. We call them cheat sheets, <laughs> okay? If you come to classes, you have your books, so just follow those ones. So quantum merit is a legal principle that, okay? Look at all of the options in here, okay? Required consideration to be quantifiable in the eyes of the court, void all of the contracts, is that what it stands for? Or prevents the consideration? No, it actually gives the consideration, that's not true. But what is the keyword that they're looking for? You see, I want you to understand the keywords. So again, the quantum merit, if they're referring to that, it's always the promise that they want you to know. It's, it's a promise from the courts to pay a reasonable amount. So again, nobody tells you how much, but the courts will basically decide on that. Okay, that, that's why it's better in the context to add how much they will pay you, right? So, so you don't have to go through quant quantum merit stuff. Okay, question two. Which of the following statement is not a true statement? So this is good. So this is, you see how they give you, and again, how do you know if it's chapter one question? Look at all of your keywords. You'll have the common law, you have the um, equitable law. Do you see all that stuff? That's a definition. That's how you know it comes from chapter one question, okay? Our students, every time we go for the exam, they always come back and give us feedbacks, and they always tell us, okay, that's how many questions I've seen out of the chapter one. That's how, out of the chapter two. Why? Because they know the keywords, and they know exactly what separates those chapters from one to another ones. Okay. So option one, is that true? Because the conflict between the common law and the equitable, equitable will prevail. So that's stronger than the common, that's true. Option two, common law and the statute law, statute will prevail, that's true, because statute is the strongest one. Option three, now that's the false statements, because again, between the statute and the equitable, it's not the equitable, it's the statute that will win, okay? So again, these are the questions just like that. Question three, precedence. Precedent form a major part of the common law system. Another major source of our law is the legislation. And which of the following could be called legislation? Again, legislation comes from which government? From the, <laughs> from the government, from, from the statute law, right? So for that reason, if they say legislation, remember the keyword I gave you? Is the Land Title Act, okay? Next one, question four. Which of the following best describes the difference between the common law and the statute law? Now, put a star next to this one because they love this one. This is the tree case out of all of them, okay? So let's talk about the statute law. So the statute law refers to the written decision of the judges, so that means they all written down, where the common law refers to the unwritten law principles. Do you think the common law is not written? It is written, and it's written by the judges, right? It's a judge-made law. So for that reason, option one is out, okay? How about option number two? In answering the legal question, the judge will first look at the relevant common law and then he will refer to the statute, okay? Remember what we talked about this one before? So again, if somebody, if the judge wants to look at things, is he gonna look at the weakest law or is he gonna look at the strongest law? Of course, why would he waste his time on the weakest law? So he, for that reason, it becomes a false statement because again, the judge will always look first at the, at the statute law and then he'll follow to everything else. So for that reason, it becomes a false statement. Okay, what are they looking for? Best describes the difference between, so they're looking for the true statements. Look at option three, see if that's a good one. The commonly refers to the judge-made law, right? So the judge is the one who makes the decisions basically, recorded in the written decisions, which is true, where the statute law refers to the legislation, you see how the keywords match together, enacted by the government. So option three is the best one, because again, Refers to the judgment law, that's the common law, and the legislation comes through the government, that's the statute law. So that's what I mean by the keywords. So every time they talk about something, I want to make sure that you put them to, it's like a puzzle, okay? Put them together in the right places, okay? And option four, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, so question five, where you are? Where a case is brought before the judge in British Columbia Supreme Court. The judge, look at option, okay, so this is where we're going to work on the keywords again. Look at option one. The judge may exercise only the equitable jurisdiction. That means only equitable law he can look at. Is that true? Yes or no? So again, when you see keywords like this, a lot of times when they say, oh, it's only this, or it's only that, or they'll say regardless on the client's instructions. Do you see how strong they are? 
and that's the indication of the false statements because it's not only the equitable i can look i can also look at common and statue all of the other things for that reason if i see my access is only something one it becomes a false statement okay how about blah, blah. look at options you tell me if you like this one though the judge may exercise both equitable and the common law to restrictions in deciding the matter so can i judge look at the common law and the equitable you see when they say may exercise both it's not like they can do them both but they will look at them both they will work with both and then they will pick one remedy from only one court you see from the one law so for that reason that's what they're aiming for an exam they love this question they're always going to test you with this sentence itself just know for the exam they want you to know that as a true statement so that should be the right answer but look at option number three Okay. Where the common law and the equitable conflict, the judge must apply. You see how they say the judge must apply the common law, it's too strong. And between the common and the equitable, it's probably going to go towards the actual, the, uh, the, the other law. It's going to be towards the equitable law, not the common law. Okay? So for that reason, option two is the best one. Right? That's what they're looking for. Judge may exercise both of them. Okay, question six, page four. Which of the following statements considering the equitable jurisdiction of the court is true? Which one is a true statement in here? Look at option one. So with the rules of equity and common law conflict, right? so if there's a conflict between common and equitable, the court will apply the common rule, true, false. Now you, 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 you already know this stuff. So again, between equitable and common is not the common they're gonna choose, they're gonna go towards the equitable law. Right? So for that reason, option one is out, okay? Option two, the equitable remedies are available to parties in a court action um as of right regardless of their conduct okay so you see you need to figure out which one sounds better than the other one so an exam they're always going to give you two good choices and then you have to figure out which one is true and which one is false so again if i use anything like this if i look at option two and says equitable remedies are available to parties in court action as a right regardless of their conduct if i just see the word regardless it's automatically red flag for me why because it's too strong i've seen regardless only once on the mortgage exams and that's where my mortgage i'll show them where it comes from but in most of the cases it's always going to be a false statement in this case okay but let's keep this one let's pretend you didn't know this one look at option number three okay the rules of equity developed as a remedy of the rigidity of the common law in England okay now that sounds good because what's the whole idea of the equitable law is to soften up the common law because common law is so rigid it's so strict it's not the judge cannot make decisions so the whole idea of the equitable law is to soften up to make it better so now the judge had become more flexible so again what they're looking for is option number three but I want you to tell me what's the problem with option number four specific performance injunction and then legal damages are three types of the equitable remedy what's the problem now remember what i told you before can you ever mix and match the remedies can you put the damages in the same place as as your um as the other remedies because where's the specific comes from it comes from the equitable where's the injunction comes from it comes from the equitable law but what should have been instead of damages damages only comes based on the common law so again, they're not mix and matchable. If they try to say that the specific and damages will come up together, then it becomes a false statement systematically. But what should have been instead of damages? Remember? Specific, injunction, and quantum merit. As much as you deserve. Okay, good job. Okay, so let's continue. For the exam, they also want you to know the different categories of the law. That's another thing you have to know. So when I say categories, there's only two categories and they will test you on the public law category. But because again, as I told you before, chapter one is a foundational chapter, what will happen, we'll use those um, keywords all the way through the other 26 chapters all together. So if I say, oh, I'll sue you under the civil law, or I'll sue you under the private law, the tort law, it actually all reference to the same thing. So again, just get, I want you to get used to different words in here, okay? So the first category is a private matter. Private matter, that means it's just a matter between the two individuals. One wants to sue the other one, and it's just nothing to do with the government. Government doesn't want to be part of it because it's too small for them, okay? So anything civil matter, okay? So if somebody sues you because you breached the contract, that's a, that's a private law, that's a civil law, that's the tort law. So again, on the example, say, oh, I'll sue you under the tort law, all they're trying to tell you that it's just a private matter, okay? So, but then we have a public law. Public law has only one name to that. There's no other ones. And a public matter, now this is when it's going to be between an individual and it's between the state. State is the government. So it's between you and a government. Now the government is interested in you. Why? Because there's three things might happen. 
and for the exam they will test you on those ones so again if you haven't paid your taxes okay now is that a private matter or is that a public matter now do you think the government wants to be part of it now and they're like where's my money <laughs> i'll come after you right now because you haven't paid taxes so that's definitely a public matter because government wants to be part of it number two if it's a criminal matter so again if you kill somebody guess what that becomes a public matter now or if it's a constitutional one so something to do with political stuff whatever right so constitutional criminal and what's the other one and the taxational stuff three things that comes as a public matter so if you have this question like you you have a sample of it question seven on page five which of the following acts would engage a category of law that is considered to be as a public law if somebody breaches something that's between the individuals negligence um, you said something carelessly, somebody relied on it, it's between the individuals, but which one is definitely becomes a public matter? Taxational stuff, okay? Divorce, hopefully that's a private matter, <laughs> okay? So again, that's what they're referring to. Okay, so now this is the question that does not come up too often in the exam, but if it does, I want to make sure that you have a very clear understanding between the court systems that we have. When can you sue people and how much can you sue them for and which court you will take them to? Okay, hopefully it's never gonna apply to your personal life, but on the exam they might ask you, okay? So the small claims courts, think of it as the smallest court that we have. Now, why do they want you to know so much about the small claims? Because it's only made for the small matters, and this court has two limitations. First limitation is about money. How much do you wanna sue them for? So if you wanna sue them for less than 35,000, then yes, you can take them to small claims. So again, if it's a small amount of money, if it's under 35,000, you take them to small claims, okay? The second limitation in that court, because it's a free court, they'll tell you, okay, money, how much you're gonna sue them for? If it's less, then come to us. The second one is where are you gonna take them to court? So again, you can't take them anywhere you want to. It's not like what is more convenient for you. You're actually gonna take um, a defendant to where he lives or where the action happened. You see, if I was a plaintiff and I'm suing you, okay because you stole my car <laughs> okay and if i want to sue you if i live in tawasin and then you live in west vancouver i actually have to take you all the way where you live not where i live it's always where the defendant lives or where the action happens so if you stole my car on robson street and there's a court in robson street then guess what i can take you in that court too okay but not where the plaintiff lives that's what they want you to understand next one if you decided to appeal now this is another thing you have to see see how it says uh, lowest trial court now, what is a trial? Trial, that means you're going to be in front of the judge. So that means if you have something to say, you have somebody to talk to, okay? And it goes back and forth. So if they ask you which one is the lowest trial court, small claims. Why? Because you have the judge in front of you. The next court that you're going to go to, if you decided to appeal, you can go to Supreme Court of BC. Now, this is the court that is still a trial court. So that means you're still going to have the judge in front of you. But this court, because you're going to pay lots of money for that court, has no money limitation, okay? Has no territorial limitation. That means you can take them to any court you want. So you don't have to drive all the way to West Van if you don't live there. So again, you can take them to whatever is more convenient for you because you're paying for that court. So remember, small claims has limitations. The Supreme Court has zero limitations, okay? There's nothing they can stop you to. So sue them for as much as you wanted to. But again, on the exam, if they ask you which one is the highest trial court, this is going to be the Supreme Court of BC. Why? Because there's after this, if you look at this, the other two courts have no more trials. So that means you're not going to be in front of the judge anymore. Okay? So Supreme Court of BC is the highest trial court. And it also deals as an appeal court. So that means you can appeal from this one to go to the, small, uh, to the next court. Okay? So if I ask you which one is an appeal court, okay? Could be all of them. But the highest trial will be the Supreme Court of BC. So again, the point is, no limitations, and this is the only type of court where the judge can actually, to, he, he wants to hear you again, he can do that. So again, if you already went for small claims and now you go here and the judge says, yeah, you know what, let's talk again. Tell me more what to happen, okay? So that's the only court that can happen this. And then what happens then? Still, if you wanna appeal, what happens then? You can still appeal, but the next court is gonna be the highest one in BC. So please watch for this. If they ask you out of all of the courts, which one is the highest one in British Columbia, you'll never put your foot on any farther than this. So appeal is the highest one in BC, okay? And when I say the highest one, it's an appeal court, so that means you can still appeal in there, but guess what? Do you think that you're gonna have a judge in front of you? Do you think you're still gonna to talk to somebody in here? And this is where it's not gonna work that way because that's it. The highest trial was the Supreme Court of BC. And if you just wanna appeal, what they will do, they will look at the 
previous decisions from the other courts and then they'll come up with their own decision. Do you see how it works in here? So again, for that reason, they're not going to listen to you again. Okay. Um, they're not going to, yeah, so that's it. And then they will ask you this. They'll say, which one is the highest court in the whole Canada? Okay. Now it's another Supreme. So as, as you see, we have two Supremes. Can I give you the rule? The rule is if they hide all the stuff from you and it says, put them from the smallest to the highest court. What do you do? The rule is the two Supremes have to be always separated. You see how we have a pill in between? So you can never put Supreme and Supreme right next to each other. It always have to be separated. If you remember that rule, then you're good. Okay. Because I'm sure you'll remember the small claims on the top. Then one of the Supremes, BC sounds smaller than Canada, right? And a pill in the middle. And then we have Supreme Court of Canada. So now this court is again, is the highest appellate court. So that means again, that's where you can, again, do you think they want to hear you? <laughs> do you think anybody can show up in that course? Now this is where it's very, it's only made for a high cases. So if you pill, kill 20 people or whatever, you might end up in there. <laughs> okay. But otherwise you appeal will be the highest court in BC. Okay. So again, no evidence is reheard, no requirements to hear all of the appeals. So again, they're not going to listen to anybody. So again, the high score for you will be the appeal. Okay. So let's do one question. Question eight on page five, which of the following statement is false in here? Okay. That's interesting. So we're going to go statement by statement. So don't go ahead of me. Look at option A. The BC Supreme Court acts as a trial court only. So Supreme Court of BC acts only as a trial. Is that true? Yes or no? You see how they use that word only again? Okay. So again, it acts as a trial, but also as an appeal court. So for that reason, it becomes a false statement. Okay. Then what do you do? Now, because you guys are new and you're just starting to learn this, we teach you guys to do the method of elimination. So that's very important. So if I look at option A and I know that this is already a false one and they're looking for the false, I'll keep everything that has A and I will cross off everything that doesn't have an A. Now look what I'm doing next. I know that I'm not looking at D options anymore, but I'm looking between B and C and see which one is the false one or the right one. So at least I know that I don't have to read the option D, but we're going to do all of them. <laughs> okay. Option B and I feel from the small claims is to be held at the BC court of appeal. So small claims, does it go to the appeal or does it go something to something else? Small claims goes to the Supreme. So again, Supremes always have to be in the middle. So if anything you come through, it has to be Supreme in the middle. So it's, it doesn't go here to here. It goes from the, uh, from the small claims to the Supreme court. Okay. For that reason, it becomes a false statements. That's how you already know the answer is. Okay. But let's read the other ones. Make sure that you know why they're true. The Supreme court of Canada is the highest appellate court in Canada. And that's, that's true. It's the whole, the highest in Canada. And then option D. The BC Supreme Court is the highest trial level. So again, if I look back at Supreme Court, one way, so for that reason, that becomes a true statement too. Okay. So again, if you just use the method of elimination, then you don't have to go that far, right? You don't have to read that many statements in the end. Okay. So this is new. We've never had this before. I'm super excited about this. And it only in British Columbia at this point right now. And on the exam, they start asking you about this CRT, the Civil Resolution Tribunal. Okay. So something that we apparently now we have the court online. Okay. So why is this so good? Because again, it's quick. You only have to pay them $200 and you're going to get the results within 60 days. So all that information I just gave you just for your knowledge, just to let you know that this is awesome. Right? But for the exam, they start testing you and they give you a very, very, very simple question, which I'll show you how it looks like, but they will ask you about the civil resolution tribunal stuff. Okay. So think of it as it's civil. Okay. It's small matters basically. And it's usually created for, so it's an online tribunal tasked with the resolving almost all of the strata corporation disputes. So because we have so many strata buildings now, we have so many townhouses, apartment buildings, and guess what? People complain there's uh, strata fees and there's that and there's, there's a lot of disputes going on and the small claims court cannot handle everything. And they said, oh my gosh, that's a lot of work. So what they've done, they created for you something that is online, that is cheaper for you. It's faster for you. You don't have to hire lawyers in here, right? You just basically submit your files to this um, CRT, right? Through the civil resolution tribunal stuff. Now it's again, who can apply? There's so many different things you can do. If you haven't paid your strata fees and you have some disputes going through non-enforcement of the strata bylaws, so if they haven't enforced the bylaws in the right way, then you can come and deal in this strata small claims. It's just an example for you, right? Even some certain when it comes to vehicle accidents, they even give you injury dispute up to 50,000. So there's a lot of different cases that could go through this 
civil resolution tribunal, but for the exam that we need to know it's about strata stuff, most of it, okay? And there's no monetary limit for the strata corporation disputes, even though for injuries, maybe up to 50, but when it comes to strata stuff, come here. That's what they want you to know, eh? Don't, don't, don't bombard the small claim courts, <laughs> okay? So this is what you have to know the most. They want you to know this process, how do you get through the CRT? So these three potential phases involved in the, setting the dispute through the CRT. So there's three different ways. And on exam, they'll ask you which one is the first one, which one is the second one, which one is the third one. And that's all they're gonna ask you for, okay? So the first phase is a negotiation. So basically, they say, okay, so here's your file, you applied it online, right? It's where the parties will communicate online in the effort to settle the dispute. So try and they first say, let's negotiate, let's figure out things before it gets to, before we enforce something against your will. So negotiation comes first, then it goes through the facilitation. So this is kind of like a mediation in some way. And this is when the CRT staff, so again, I'm sure they, they, they're gonna have some knowledge behind their backs, but it's the actual staff that work for the CRT online court will assist the parties in attempting to reach, uh, to reach the settlement. So again, they're trying to facilitate for you and this is okay, let's settle that in. Let's see what we can come up with. And if people still cannot come up with their own decision, what happens then it goes to phase number three, okay? Adjudication, adjudication, I can't even say that, <laughs> where the adjudicator will make a decision to make it enforceable in the court system. So now they say, let's negotiate, okay? We'll facilitate for you if you still cannot come up with something. And then if you still have problems, then we'll make decisions on your behalf, okay? So this is the three steps. I'll show you the question. I know it's easy, but it's on the exams now. Question nine, page five. So the first place of setting disputes through the civil resolution tribunal is typical key one. Okay, the first one, is that a facilitation? Is that a negotiation? Or is that a adjudication? Which one is it? <laughs> okay, it's negotiation, right? So you start with negotiation, then it goes to facilitation with mediation, and then it goes down, excuse me. Mediation. <laughs> okay, so that's good. Next one. So this is the best question. If you have this one exam like you, you will love this one. Now, when somebody talks about the trial process, let's say somebody stole your car again, and you come in front of me and I'm the judge, and it's okay, so uh, what have you done so far? So how do you start the process? It starts with pleading. You see that word pleading in there? Pleading is what they want you to know for the exams. Not everything else, but the pleading itself. So what is pleading? Pleading is basically how you start your actual process. So you're gonna come to court, and what do you do? You start with a notice of a civil claim. Who does the notice? So again, if somebody stole the car from you, then what do you do? Now you become a plaintiff because you're the one who says, I'm suing somebody, I'm coming after somebody, and that somebody will become your defendant because they will have to defend themselves, okay? So first, who's doing this stuff? Is that a defendant and you're gonna do something? Of course it's you, okay? So what are you gonna do? You're gonna start with the notice of a civil claim. So this is where he says, here's the notice, and you basically tell the court this is what's gonna happen, and this is why I'm suing that person, he stole my car, and I'm suing him for that much money. So you're telling your story to court through the notice of a civil claim done by a plaintiff, by you, okay? And a defendant, if he decides to respond, then he will be, he'll do a response of a civil claim. So that means he's gonna write his letter back to court and say, oh, no, 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 this is what happened. He told me to steal his car and, uh, I don't know, threw it somewhere else so he gets the insurance from the <laughs> insurance company. I don't know, some story. So defendant will come up with his story and we're gonna call it a response of a civil claim. Do you see that? So notice comes first and then it goes response. So on the exam, if they ask you what splitting is made out of, or if sometimes they ask you which one comes first, which one is second, I wanna make sure that you know your steps and you know who is done by who. Okay, only the defendant will respond and you will do the notice. So after pleading, it gets through discovery. That's a mediation. There's no judge involved. I don't see this on the exam. My people don't see it. It's kind of a mini trial. Um, they try to settle the case right here. Okay, mediation. Then it goes through trial. That's when the judge will be involved. He will look at both of the cases and whoever loses the case, he'll, so first of all, he'll come up with the judgment and whoever loses the case, we're going to call him the judgment debtor. Right, so it's a debt to him. So question 10 on page five, which of the following occurs during the pleading stuff? So again, you see the question is always about the pleading stuff. So if they ask you which one is a pleading one, what comes from that, okay? It's not the trial, it's not the judgment, but it's the a response of a civil claim. Who's it done by again? By a defendant, good job, okay? So now the judge said, okay, whoever lost the case, we're gonna call him a judgment 
debtor, <laughs> I call it debtor, but whatever, somebody who lost the case, right? So he says, okay, you lost it, it is a debt to you, that means you have to pay for that. You see how it works in here? Now, for the exam, to me, that's my key word. So if I see the word enforcement of the judgment, I know what they're referring to. That means the judge already figured out who lost the case, and now he says, look, now you have to pay the person back. How are you gonna pay them back? Let's see how, let's see where you have those money. Let's see how we can find the money from you so we can take it away from you and pass it on to the other person who won the case, okay? So for that reason, what they're gonna do first, they're gonna do the examination. So an exam, if they say, how do you enforce it? Keyword will be examination. So what does that mean by the examination? So again, that person who lost the case, can we look at him and say, okay, let's see what kind of job you have? Because maybe we can get the money from your salary, right? Let's see if you have a nice piece of land. Maybe we can put a lien against you and then just freeze it and take the money away from you from your land. Do you see what happens? So first they do examination stuff, okay? Then the next thing, now this is interesting. And I always ask my people in my class and say, okay, can we do execution? Yes or no? Canada, can we do execution? And most people will do what? They'll shake their hand and like, there's no way. Because what are we thinking of execution? Cutting somebody's head off. That's what I think. So for the exam, they don't think that way. Because if they say, can you execute somebody? Okay. They actually referring to take their stuff and seize it and sell it. So if that person who, I don't know, stole your car, whatever, but they have, I don't know, some other assets, like, like I don't know, another car or whatever that is, they can do execution. That means they'll take them, they sell them and then they give it those money back to you. You see how it works? So again, for example, they say, can you do execution? Your head should be going this way, <laughs> okay? So examination, execution, what else can we do with the enforcement of the judgment? Remedies against the land. Remember what I said? If we find that he has a nice piece of land, can we put a lien against his land? Can we freeze it and say, that's it, they can't take it. You can sell it until you pay that person back. That's what lien is, right? Freezing it, okay? And then the last one, they will always question on this one, garnishing the order or garnishing wages means the same thing. Even though we put 30% in here, but that's just for a reason. They're not gonna ask you for this. But just, if I say this to you, can I come and enforce the judgment against you and garnish all of your wages? Now, what did that just say? Would that be a true false statement? All of the wages, it becomes false. Because if I say some of the wages, then that's true because it's apparently 30%. If you go back in my country, no problem. All of it is good. <laughs> but in Canada, some of it, because you still have to live in something, okay? So again, keywords, when I see enforcement. I'll show you the questions. Okay, so on page five, question 11, which of the following is not an available course of action? The successful plaintiff is sticking to enforce. You see how do you use the word enforce the judgment? Every time you see the word enforce, you have to know, okay? An execution, right? And all the other things. So execution is one of it, okay? Can we do garnishing order, which is your wages? Yes, you can. Can you put a lien? Yes, you can, but what's this one, okay? This is definitely not one of them because that's not how you enforce the judge, but what is this? What is this? This is your steps of the pleading, okay? So it's one of the steps of the pleading, and what is pleading? Pleading is when you apply <laughs> and say, here's my letter to court, right? Eh? First is a notice, and then it's a response. So it has nothing to do with the enforcement of the judgment. It's something happens way before that, okay? Next one, question 12. Which of the following statement is false? The doctrine of stare decisis. Ooh, remember that doctrine of stare decisis? What does it stand for? Let the former decision stand. It comes under which law again? Look back at the notes. It comes based on a common law, right? So let the former decision stand. The doctrine of stare decisis provides uniformity to the common law system, okay? Look back on your page one where there is a common law. And I want you to look at that box because I want you to start using those keywords. If somebody talks about the common law, Okay, do they have the word doctrine of stare decisis in that box? Okay, yes it does. Does it have the word uniformity in there? Yes it does, so for that reason, you see how many good statements in one statement? So we have to assume that, okay, that's a true statement. Look at option two. The Supreme Court of Canada is not required to hear all of the appeals. That's true, do you think Canada will hear all of you guys? <laughs> I don't think so. And option three, the Supreme Court of BC may exercise both of the, remember that sentence again? The, the Supreme Court of BC may exercise both of the laws. Of course, when they say exercise, that means they can look at both of them, okay? But what's the problem with option number four? Because when they talk about taxation, it should have been, it should have been, it should have been not a private law, it should have been a public law. And that's what makes it a false statement. Question 13. When the judge distinguishes the case on its facts. Now, I have to explain you this one because I haven't. <laughs> when somebody says distinguish is what I'm looking at 
um, it, it's me as a judge looking based on the common law. And I said, ah, based on common law, even though you pimped out your car and you love your car, but there's nothing I can do uh, based on the common law. I can't get to the car back, so what do I do? I think there's a lot of crucial facts in this case, and I want to make my own decision. This is what distinguishes the case on its facts means. That means the judge says, I'm not looking at the common law. I'm making my own decisions because I think there's a lot of crucial facts in here. Okay? So he'll go towards the equitable law. That's what it stands for. Question 14. Which of the following would not be an available to the judgment creditor as a means of the enforcement of the judgment? Okay? So again, you see how the word is? Enforcement. And they look and see which one is not one of the ways to do that. Do we have the keyword as an examination under the enforcement? Can I examine that person to see what does he have? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. Examination was one of them. Execution, lien, wages. Okay. Second one. Do we have that writ of execution? Yes, we do. That's a keyword. Okay. Three or four. Does three have a keyword? Yes, it does. It has garnishing order, which is wages. And that's okay. But what's the problem number four? Now, first of all, we never even talk about the read of summons, but the read of summons is the old way of saying um, the notice of a civil claim is the same thing, okay? But on the exam, unfortunately, they'll put a lot of extra things just like this, just to throw you off. But again, if I don't explain you something, that's indication of the false statements to you, okay? So kind of be smart on that part. Okay, question 15. We're almost done, I promise. <laughs> Which of the following statement is true when it comes to doctrine of stare decisis? Again, they're asking for that doctrine of stare decisis stuff, okay? Look at option one only, only option one. All cases that have already been decided in courts are predictable with absolute certainty. So that means if I'm looking at the previous decisions, are they with some certainty or the absolute? You remember that the word absolute is way too strong. That makes it a false statement. Option two, if the court in BC has already decided a particular issue and a subsequent court is faced with the same issue, the early decision should govern the subsequent decision. Now that sounds more like a doctrine of stare decisis. So let the former decision stand is the same thing as what they put in option two. So this is, should have been the right answer, but look at option number three. Find me the problem. Okay, I'm not just gonna let you go that easily. So this decisions from the Ontario court will have no relevance to the court of BC. So again, what happens when I cannot find any courts just like, so any decisions just like yours in British Columbia, what do I do? Can I go to different provinces? Yes, I can. So again, it says no relevance. Oh, yes, it does. So that means I can go to anywhere I want to. Option two is what they want, but what's the problem in option number four? The courts of appeal are authoritative for judges in the BC courts. People, most of them don't understand what it means, but let me explain you. So that means if the judge from the small claims or the judge from the Supreme Court of BC, do they have to get authorization from the appeal court just to, so they can make the decisions? Do you think they have to ask for somebody's um, approval, they don't have to. So it's not like they will be an authoritative towards the other judges, right? So that doesn't work. So again, what they're aiming for is always this one, right? So they're looking for that doctrine of stare decisis. They're always going to test you. So chapter one is finished. It's not a bad chapter, as you see, right? So a lot of foundational stuff in here. And you'll hear all of these terms all the way through the other ones. So do your quizzes and uh, go back through your cheat sheets if you have to. And then until you get high scores in the quizzes, do not move to the next chapter.